just before we move on, I want to cover a couple housekeeping items. Um, there'll be coffee and muffins available in the trade show area. Uh, we will be having a scheduled coffee break later, but feel free to help yourself at any time. Uh, the lunch today is going to be held upstairs in the Oval, and you need a name tag to get into lunch, so make sure you have registered and have your name tag. Um, also, certified crop advisor credits are available for today's session, so if you're CCA and looking to get those, the, the sign-up sheets are out at the front registration desk. And uh, finally, just a big thank you to our sponsors of this conference. Uh, we wouldn't be able to pull it off without their support and generosity, so thank you. The slideshow with their logos is there as well. They'll be officially recognized tomorrow at the awards banquet, so but uh, thank you. Uh, so our next speaker this morning is going to be Misty Crony with LP Consulting. Misty will be presenting the results of the AGC on-farm agronomy initiative with the present title, Your Levy Dollars at Work. Misty joined LP Consulting in 2008, where she advanced her career from junior agrologist to project manager to now vice president. She has designed, implemented, and overseen logistics of waste to resource programs and incorporates residuals in all crop management plans. She has created over 2,000 crop management plans and designed an agriculture asset evaluation program to track soil health and land across Canada. In 2020, Misty received the Nova Scotia Institute of Agrologists Distinguished Agrologist Award. So, welcome, Misty. Hi everybody, thanks for coming out. Um, so yeah, as said, I'm going to uh, talk to you a bit about what all the levy dollars have been doing with our on-farm agronomy research. Um, I don't have time today to go through everything, I could probably talk to you all morning about them. Um, so we're just going to go through five of them. So we have the soybean uh, fungicide trial, the soybean rolling trial, the corn seeding rate trial, the barley nitrogen trial, and the winter wheat trial that we'll talk about today. So first up is the soybeans. The soybean fungicide trial is probably our deepest data set. We've got uh, 70 sites across the Maritimes from 2015 to 2022. And the treatments for those, there's four. The first is the uh, fungicide applied at R1, or first flower. Then again, at, uh, then we had a, an application at R2, or full flower. And then in 2018, we actually added a double application where we went in at R1 and R2. And then, of course, the control where there was none. So the purpose of the trial was to determine if there's a yield advantage to applying fungicides in soybeans and what is the best timing to do that. So the main disease of concern, of course, was the white mold. Um, we're seeing that more and more, and it really can decimate fields. So my big question was, does the application of, of fungicides increase yield in fields that have white mold? So I started digging into the data and really looked at where we had the results for the white mold. So since 2009, or 2019, there were 39 fields that had white mold in at least one treatment. There was 50, or sorry, there was 39 fields in total with 152 treatments. And there was 19 of the 39 fields that had white mold in at least one treatment. So roughly 50% of the fields. It was found in 59 of 152 treatments or about 40%. So there was 10, roughly 10% of the fields that had white mold in at least one treatment, but not all. So usually it's found in all of them, but not always. So looking at that data from 2019 to 2022, regardless of disease pressure, we found that there was a slight increase in yield when we had the double application of fungicide. So there's an economical difference there of point, that 0 0.1 ton to the acre if beans are $6.25 a ton, then it's around $62 an acre. And that's between the control and the R1, R2. But what I really wanted to know is, was there an increase in yield with fungicides if there wasn't any disease present? So we looked at the yields from the fields that did not have white mold. And what we see is a flat line. There really is no yield response at all. So applying fungicide does not increase yield if there's no disease present. Well, that, that's kind of a tricky thing for the room because then you're like, well, how do I know if there's gonna be disease present? 
So then we look at the incidence of white mold. I wanted to know how well is the fungicide treatments actually reducing the incidence of white mold in the fields. So when we do a disease um, assessment, we go into the fields in each treatment and do 10 to 20 counts per treatment. This data only includes the fields with white mold in at least one treatment. So the incidence is lowest with the double application of fungicide. The yields with white mold, and again, these yields are only the fields that have white mold present. You can see that the yield is highest with that uh, double application of fungicides. The second best would be the R1 treatment. So there is an increase in yield with fungicides when disease is present, just not when it's not. So then I wanted to look at the return on investment. So again, this is just the data included for the fields reporting white mold. And I looked at the price of the soybeans around 625 a metric ton. So a yield increase of 0.1 is $62. There's a couple of different fungicides that were used during the course of this trial. Stratego Pro and Acapella were the two that were used in 2022. So I grabbed the prices off of those that the farmers provided. And the Stratego Pro was significantly less expensive than the Acapella. Um, so for the cost to the acre of each treatment, I put in the lower cost um, fungicide. So you can see the cost per acre at the top of the screen there, up in here. So this is what your fungicide application is going to cost. So that's the cost of the, the fungicide plus the application spray. So to work through this, if we look at the R1 application, it's $33 uh, an acre to get the fungicide on there. We saw an increase in yield over the control of 0 0.09 tons per acre and that value of that increased yield is about $56. So our return on investment there was 70% return on investment. When we looked at the R2 application, because we didn't see nearly the yield increase from that, the yield increase was only 0 0.05, had a value of $31 a ton, so we actually saw a loss, or at best, break even, like it's two bucks. Um, this is using the lower cost uh, Stratego Pro, remember, too. So then when we look at the R1, R2, despite having the largest yield increase, the cost per acre, of course, is higher because we have two fungicide sprays and two applications. So the increase in yield of 0.14 ton to the acre is $87, but the return on investment is 32%. So the price of the fungicide does affect the return on investment. Um, both the Stratego Pro and Acapella have those prices would have a return on investment at the R1 application. Both had a loss at the R2 application, that's full flower, and only the Stratego Pro had a return on investment with the double application, because once you get into the higher price, then you start to break even on that double application. So of course, not only does the price of the fungicide affect your return on investment, so does the price of soybeans. But when I looked at, you know, okay, if the commodity prices start going down, what break point are we going to find that we're not going to want to put on fungicides? So the price for soybeans would need to fall to $367 a ton to not have a return at R1 if our fungicides stay the same price. So I thought that that was a pretty safe window. Um, with beans being around 600 bucks now, they'd have to fall to below $400 in order for you guys not to have a return on investment at that first flower. So when we look at white mold, fungicides aren't the only answer. We want to look at the contributing factors. So there are things that you can do to reduce the likelihood of having white mold in your fields. Um, contributing factors to have it, short rotations with soybeans every two to three years. So soybeans with um, history of white mold shouldn't be in rotation with potatoes, canola, pulse crops, or coal crops. I know that's really easy for me to say. Um, fall tillage is discouraged because it incorporates the spores which can survive for, yield, for years. And of course, cool, moist conditions at flowering, and that's when the infection actually gets into the plant. So the management tools that you might be able to employ or employ to reduce your white mold would be to extend your rotation with three years between soybeans, add grass if you can, um, avoid overseeding. We don't need to seed any more than 140 to 160,000 seeds per acre, and I have more data on that later. Um, plant resistant varieties, watch disease forecasting. I know Adam's working on one regionally um, that can really help you out on figuring out whether or not you need to apply that fungicide. Um, and sanitize your equipment. 
especially that there's more and more custom operators happening now. So if you have a field with white mold, get on the end of the list, not the first, um, to try to prevent the spread of the white mold. So one theme that you're going to hear from me all day, and you'll probably hear it from Aaron as well, is rotation. So when I look at the rotation effect, and this is something that came up in our stats this year, is we started looking at the number of years the crop was grown in the past three years. And this was, this really kind of pinged on every single trial we did stats on, was how often we're rotating or how often we're growing the same crop. Um, so what we looked at here was what the effect of rotation is. To read through this, Y zero, there has been no beans in that field in the past three years. This is first year out of three. And then as you go down, Y one's the year before, two years ago, three years ago, you get Y1, Y2, it means that it was the year before and two years ago. So if you grew beans in 2022, and then again the year before, and then two years ago, that means you're in three year beans right now. Year one, two, and three means you grew them this year, last year, the year before, the year before that, you're on four year beans. I can't believe there's seven people that did that. Um, I do not encourage growing beans on beans. We should rotate. And this is why we start to see our yields go down. When we see um, year three, this is our largest stretch between soybeans other than year, year zero. And so we have an increase in yield here, and we see an increase in yield here. And we need to look more into this because this is new stats that have revealed this for us, but really we think that we're seeing an increase in yield from inoculum and we're seeing an increase in yield from rest. So an increase in yield of soybeans is an increase in disease. So we don't want to see that, that yield go down because of that. So the take home for the soybean fungicide, rotate. Um, apply fungicides at R1 if your field has a history of white mold or the disease forecast is high for white mold. Um, that R1 is where you're going to get your biggest um, bang for your buck and your highest return. So the soybean rolling trial. The soybean rolling trial um, was started in 2021 and despite only having two years of data, we actually have quite a bit of data. We have 19 sites across the Maritimes. And what we did was have rolling before planting, rolling after planting, and rolling before and after planting. The purpose was to determine if rolling will improve and reduce the impact of rotation on yield. And I'll get into uh, on the next slide why we are looking at that. The seeding rate was treated as a variable in this trial. So this, the, the rolling trial piggybacked off of the conclusion of our seeding rate trial in soybeans. So just to recap what that trial was, from 2015 to 2020, we had done um, on 40 sites a seeding rate trial. And what we found was that increasing the seeding rate did not increase yields. The optimum seeding rate was between 130 and 160,000 seeds per acre, and that was based on economics, risk, and yield. Um, we found that we're losing a lot of money for overseeding. People really need to work hard at calibrating their seeders. If you need help with that, there's actually a video resource on the uh, Atlantic Grantings Council site that you can go and find. Um, and the two other important things that we found was that rotation impacts the yield more than the seeding rate, and there's actually an interaction between the seeding rate and the rotation. And that last statement is why we started the rolling trial, because we wanted to know if that rotation impact based on seeding rate was caused from a mechanical thing with, with crop residues or um, like corn trash the year before, and if rolling would actually help negate that. So the first thing you look at anytime you do um, a trial is the plant population if you're looking to see if it's uh, affecting your yields. So we looked at the plant population to see if the rolling was going to impact that. And the time of the rolling did not. Um, we theorized that there might be a potential that if you roll before, you have a nice smooth seed bed, maybe you'll get improved seed contact with uh, packing down any of that crop residue. Then we thought, well, maybe you'll have a better option if you roll after to really sink the seed into the ground to get better seed soil contact that way. Or maybe we wanted to do before and after. What we found really did not affect how many plants came up. When we looked at the yield result, 
it looked the same. Without consideration of the previous crop, the timing of the rolling really didn't affect yield. But rotation effect. So the rotation, again, has had a higher effect on yield than the timing of that rolling. And we saw that the following grain, we had a higher yield in the beans, fallow was the lowest. But then I wondered if this whole point was to see if we could negate the crop rotation effect, do, would we see a difference if we looked at the rolling before and after based specifically on the crop? So we have this divided out by corn, fallow, grain, and the soybean by the cre previous crop, and really you're not seeing any difference at all. So the timing of the rolling did not affect the yield um, based on the previous crop, and there was no mechanical effect of rolling um, to improve the yield. So our take home from this trial, rotation affects yield more than rolling does. The rolling timing does not affect yield regardless of the previous crop, but hey, it's great for a smoother harvest, so it just doesn't matter when. And that's primarily why we didn't have a control, because the farmers who were involved said basically they're going to roll. Uh, so that's the end of the soybeans. Is there any questions on the soybean trials? Before you forget your question and I move on? We're all good? Okay. Next up is this corn seeding rate trial. Oh, what sorry. Do you mean by fallow? fallow was that it was not in crop the year before. Yes. So it could have been a field that was not harvested for anything. It could have been growing up just in um, native grasses that hadn't been actively farmed the year before. Yeah. Any other questions? So the corn seeding rate trial. 2021 was the first year of the trial, so we've got two years of data under our belt. There was 22 grain sites and eight <coughs> silage sites. So we started adding in the silage data for this trial. Um, the purpose of the trial was to determine if the seeding rate affected yield. We had three treatments, 36,000 seeds to the acre, 32 and 28 and all the row widths were 30 inches. Um, so yeah, with seeding rate trials, you gotta look and see if there's actually a difference in the number of plants in the fields. And there was a, di a significant difference in plants per acre. Um, interestingly, the plants per acre for 28,000 and 32,000 targets were really accurate, um, but the 36,000 target was low. So I was really surprised to see that this, this is supposed to be up here. And I was really surprised to see that that 36,000 um, target was missed. When we look at the silage yields, there was no statistical difference in yield, but there is a cost difference. So what we're seeing is that 28,000 seeds to the acre, despite not being statistically different than 36, of course you're paying more for the seed. So if a bag of seed costs $360, the 28,000 seeds to the acre cost 126 bucks. Um, 32,000 is an additional $18 an acre. The 36,000, an additional $36 an acre. So we really wanna make sure that you're getting that value back. And right now the yields are saying no, you're not. When we look at the grain yield results, same thing. So if we look at the corn price at $425 a ton, the economical difference in yield of 0.2 ton to the acre works out to be about 85 bucks. The higher seeding cost, plus the reduced yield equals a loss of $117 an acre with the difference between the 28,000 seeds to the acre to the 36,000 seeds to the acre. So you're really losing, like $117 an acre is big in my mind. Again, we're gonna look at that rotation effect. How many years, uh, or sorry, yields by treatment and rotation type? The yield was not affected by seeding rotation and rota rotation type. And I found this surprising because with the soybean yields, when we did the seeding rate trial, we found that interaction. We're not seeing that in the corn. Um, so increasing the seeding rate did not increase the yield. Um, the yield was not affected by the seeding rate or rotation type. And we saw the same thing with the silage results. There was just a, I didn't put a graph up because the end values were so low, but really we, it was the same thing. So the rotation effect, the number of years of corn in the past rotation, um, again, rotation has a higher effect than the seeding rate does. Um, 
fewer years of corn. So this is no corn in the past three years. This is corn two years ago. So it was corn, something else than corn. We're really starting to see a decrease in yield once you start getting into corn on corn on corn. So our take home from this, increasing the seeding rate does not increase yield. The rotation type does not affect yield based on seeding rate, and the longer rotation increases the yield on your corn. Any questions on the corn? You guys are letting me off the hook, this is great. Barley, nitrogen timing trial. The nitrogen timing trial, um, investigating application timing and source of nitrogen. There was 28 sites across the Maritimes from 2019 to 2022. And all treatments received 80 pounds of nitrogen um, per acre. And the reason we chose that is because we had previously done a trial on our nitrogen rates on barley. And we had climbed right up to where we saw the yield economically decline. So um, that's where we hit our sweet spot at that 80 pounds. Um, so what we did was we put urea all up at planting. Then we split the application where we did 40 at planting and 40 at stem elongation. That's also urea. Then we added uh, an ESN mix and all at planting. So we had a 60% of the nitrogen came from urea, 40% came from ESN. And then we did the 80, per, 80 pounds the acre all at planting with a non-leaching agritain. So the products tested, that non-leaching agritain is a brand name DCD product. And the DCDs are designed to inhibit nitrification, slowing the conversion of ammonium to nitrate, reducing nitrate leaching. ESN is environmentally smart nitrogen. It's a controlled release nitrogen through advanced polymer coating. It releases nitrogen in response to growing conditions, which prevent, protects the nitrogen from loss. Pure yield, if you've heard of pure yield versus ESN, they use the same technology. Each of these products does have a premium price, so we really wanted to see if there was a, a yield bump from it, and if so, was there economics around that. For the yield results, the non-leaching agritain in the ESN did not increase yield. When we look at protein, there was no significant difference in the protein. And I was actually kind of disappointed by these results. Um, but when we look at the tissue samples, the plant's tissue, um, were, the samples were collected prior to flowering, and the non-leaching agritain in the ESN actually had higher nitrogen levels in the tissue. So the products work. I, I, I'm not certainly not discarding the fact that these products work, they do. Um, they're just cost prohibitive. So when we look at the return on investment, um, I really wanted to know if that new technology paid. And so I put this together looking at that 80 pounds of nitrogen at planting, that urea, as our baseline. So if we look at our costs with the fertilizer cost per acre of $126, the crop value was 403, so we had a net return of $277. With the split application, it was 148. I added the cost of that extra application in there. Um, the crop value, 385. Our net return, 237. So that gives us a loss of 14% from that base urea application. When we look at the non-leaching agritain, because it has a higher cost per acre, even though our crop value was essentially the same, our net return was less. So then we saw the highest decrease in our profit there of 18%. The ESN saw a decrease of 10%. So that's using um, a fall price of barley of 350 and the fertilizer prices of 2022. So really when I looked at this, if farmers are required through policy to use these products, there could see a loss in profits and I just don't think it's fair that farmers should have to shoulder all of that 18 10, 14%. When we look at nitrification factors, it made me start wondering why we weren't seeing more of a response. Um, there are a number of factors that affect nitrification, and so I just wanted to concentrate on the physical factors. Temperature is number one. So a low soil temperature decreases nitrification. Does anybody in the room take a soil temperature reading when they do planting? because cold soils in the spring is not unusual. <laughs> so um, pH, low, low soil pH reduces nitrification. I know a lot of the potato ground has pH below um, six. 
moisture. Moisture closes uh, pore space, reduces oxygen, creating anaerobic conditions. Oxygen and aeration is a factor. Repetitive tillage degrades soil structure, reducing soil tilth and aeration. So we can see a decrease in nitrification from that as well. So I think that this, we really need to dig into the stats on this, and I know Aaron and I are probably gonna do that. There's some triggers happening on that, on the stats that I, we really gotta dig into more, and I think it's gonna be interesting, but um, for today's presentation, it was just basically, the yields are saying that there's not a response. I wanna know why. So the take home from this, the nitrogen losses are very weather dependent, very weather dependent. Um, the products to prevent nitrogen loss don't always increase yield. So the use of the products can uh, reduce your profits. So for winter wheat, we looked at the seeding date trial. Sorry, pre yep. Before you go on, Misty, can you go back? I absolutely can. Share yep. conclusions. Oh, uh, take homes? Yeah. Yep. So can you turn that third item around about reducing profits to there's a social responsibility? Yes. Absolutely. Place society's role in taking care of the laws yes. that is socially responsible to do. Yeah, I, I very very well put, Alan. I think um, I think that there is a social responsibility to climate change, and if uh, the use of these types of products have been deemed um, a factor in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, then absolutely this is a social responsibility. So. Um, I just don't think that the, the potential profit loss should be really carried solely by the agriculture industry. So um, right now, OFCAF allows um, Agritain and ESN to be qualifies under their funding, but it only qualifies under the funding for a single application on a single field. And if it's been done in the past, it doesn't count. If you do it more than once, it doesn't count. Yeah. Yes. So these couple of years that you did these trials, the conditions were such that it brought the slow release of N was not a factor. It could skew it. So it's absolutely you need to plug into that. Yeah, absolutely. So when we do these types of trials, the more years you have, the the stronger your data set is. And then when they run that through the stats, that's going to take into that year, the yearly fluctuation, and it's going to, the, the stats kind of look at that in that 3D model. Um, I think there's a lot more investigation that is required in this particular trial. I think, there's, I think there's a lot of places we can dig in this data that I'd like to start digging in this data. I just don't want to bring any superficial conclusions without fully understanding what they mean. So, you know, we know that these products work. Um, we know that they're good for the environment. Let's figure out why we're not seeing a year response. Let's find out why we're not seeing a year response so that maybe if, if, if the way that they use them in Ontario, out west, Midwest states is giving them results there that we're not seeing here, let's figure out why and then maybe we can tweak our application timing or our blends or whatever to see that yield response um, and, and then go from there. But yeah, I think we have a, a pretty deep data set that we can dig into with the stats and see what we can get out of that. Any other questions? I guess another comment is perhaps there's an opportunity to reduce that 80, 80 pound end, end rate, maybe by 10 or 20 or whatever percent, and see if you get a similar yield. Yeah, I was thinking that too, because when you looked at that tissue, and like, okay, if the, if the tissue is having a higher nitrogen concentration, how come that's not converting to yield? So maybe we can reduce the nitrogen on those. Um, two sections and see if we can get the equal amount. Yeah, no, that came across my mind too when I was putting this together. Thank you for that comment. We all good? Okay, when are we? Anybody who was at the presentation for Yen last night are gonna go, yeah, we heard this already, Misty. Um, the winter wheat seeding date trial, 
There was 24 sites in Nova Scotia and PEI from 2020 to 2022, and the trial was to determine if increasing seeding rate will offset late seeding dates. So we have a number of treatments. Initially, we had three treatments. We had an early seeding date at 1.7 million seeds per acre, and we had two late seeding dates, one at 1.7 million seeds per acre and one at 2.1. But then life happens and farming happens, and it was getting harder for farmers to get that target seeding date down, so we kind of had to work with, with what you guys had available, so we added two mid-season dates. So we have a mid-season 1.7 million seeds per acre and then a mid-season of 2.1 million seeds per acre. So the seeding dates are there. Um, we actually have eight sites planted in the fall of 22 that we'll be harvesting this year as well. So when we look at yield results, the early seeding date had the highest yields. I don't think anybody in the room will be surprised by that. But what I thought was really neat is that the mid and late seeding dates increased with the seeding rate but still lower than the early seeding. And this is, this is the one that I think is cool because we're talking a week later. So September 10th to 25th versus September 26th to October 9th, from early seeding at 1.7, you hang out for a week, you, you delay for a week, there's your yield, it drops. So even if you're a week later, you can increase your seeding rate and you'll almost hit the same yields. Now, our end value on this is only eight. We only have, we don't nearly have as many um, sites for this mid-season as we do the early and the late, but I thought it was still very interesting. When we look at the return on investment, how much does delayed planting cost? So the early seeding rate at 1.7, the seed cost per acre was $85 a, uh, an acre. The value of that yield was 1,039, so that gave us a net of 954. So if we look at that mid seeding, which was potentially a week later, the value of the yield was 855, so our net was 770. So delaying planting by one to two weeks from early to mid can cost $184 an acre at the same seeding rate. That's, that's huge. If delayed planting is necessary, which a lot of times it is, you can increase the seeding rate, but you're still not gonna get the same yield as you would if it was early. So delayed planting by four weeks can cost $151 an acre, even with the higher seeding rate. So plant early. Um, if you have to delay, just up your seeding rate. So the take home on that, yeah, plant early. Increasing seeding rate does not compensate for delayed planting as much as we'd like it to. And even if you're only two weeks delayed, increase that seeding rate. So I didn't have time today to go over all of the trials that we've done through the on-farm agronomy. Um, we have a corn boron trial, a soybean nitrogen sulfur trial, barley UAN trial, a soybean boron trial, field peas seeding rate trial that was done years ago, a gypsum trial, and an intensive oats management trial as well using nitrogen, um, nitrogen timing, growth regulators, and fungicides as well. So that's all I have. If you guys have any questions. You guys are a quiet group today. Yep. Yep. No, it actually degrades. Yep. I don't know how long it takes for it to degrade. I know that you can walk through the field later in the season, you can find the little capsules, but when you pick them up, they're empty. And then the following year, they're gone. So, no, because it, it does degrade. Yeah, it is a degradable plastic, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, you guys are making this easy. Oh, sorry, yep. Yep. Yep, so we do have the varieties all tracked. We just don't have a large enough data set now to start pulling those out. If you guys all just planted two varieties, I'd probably have enough to show you, but yeah. So I looked at that, but there was too many different ones. It would be like an end value of one. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, like you're running out of time. Like if you have a 45 day ESN. Now, the way that ESN works is it's not, it's not the same as your typical, you know, polymer coating. So most, most polymer coatings, and any fertilizer guys in the room can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my understanding is that if you have your typical sulfur coated urea, that breaks down from weather, and then all of a sudden you get a release all at once of, of the nitrogen that's there. So you have a delay, but it's, it's, there's a difference between a delayed release and a controlled release. And the way I understand um, ESN is that you have that polymer coating, and as moisture and temperature affect it, it swells and shrinks. And so it will actually release, it'll trickle out that nitrogen. So it's not that there's no nitrogen being released. It's just re being released when there's, when there's optimum temperature and moisture, which is the same temperature and moisture that plants need to take up nitrogen in the first place. So it's actually just trickling out that nitrogen for the days the plant's actually going to take it up. Um, so I don't think that that having it not enough soon enough, um, I don't think we're running out of time necessarily with how that product is supposed to work, but if it's a 45 delay before 100% of that ESN has been released, then yeah. Because like I said, the nitrogen's there at flower. So there could be something to that, Eric, absolutely. Any other questions? I think we're good. All right, thanks everybody for having me and uh, I'll be around for lunchtime at least. So if you wanna hit me up on any other questions for any of the other trials that we're doing, let me know. And if you wanna hear more about them, just, yeah, contact AGC. Thank you, Misty. Uh, I guess now we're at the scheduled coffee break and trade show, so everyone please take some time to interact with the companies in the trade show, and we'll come back here for 1045.